When religion deteriorates into a spectator sport, we cease being people of true faith. Shalom and welcome to Crosstalk. My name is Joshua Weiss and today I have the privilege of starting off a brand new series. We're going to spend the next several episodes going through a brand new book, God, Forgive Me? by my father, Dr. Randy Weiss. I know it's strange to see a book with a question as the title, but this book is exploring what it takes for God to forgive us. I don't want to spoil it for you, so let's jump right in. Ah, religion is sort of like having a BB gun. It's all fun and games until somebody loses an eye. Some of us have taken shots from religion. They hurt. Others have taken shots at religion, and that hurts too. Perhaps a few have lost an eye or have a blurred vision of their religion. Many have become show blind. We attend religious services to enjoy the show. We see the people on stage, we follow their instructions when not too intrusive. And if the man or woman on stage gets too demanding or we don't think they're playing their part appropriately, we simply move on to warm a seat in a new theater with a more understanding pastor or rabbi. When religion deteriorates into a spectator sport, we cease being people of true faith. To fully enjoy our religion, whatever it is, we must transcend the show and become engaged participants within and without the forums of faith. It is my hope that we can all determine where we belong in religion and fulfill the purpose to which God has called us. Therein, we enjoy the value added to our lives and families. A loving, vibrant faith lived inwardly and outwardly will also endear our religion to those around us in need of a more secure foundation. Our society has been damaged by the attacks against families and faith. The foundations have been destabilized. This book asks and answers hard questions about foundational elements of Judaism and Christianity. Both religions address the problem of sin in the lives of adherents. As can be seen in headlines around our nation, plagued by violence and chaos, when left unchecked, the sin problem creates devastating consequences. But there is a fix. This book will detail the solutions proposed by two religions. Both have historically addressed the sin problem through sacrifice and atonement with some confusing distinctions that deserve clarification. Regarding this, I believe God has been clear about one thing in particular. Not all sacrifices are created equal. In another very confusing time long ago, God's appointed high priest declared, This is thy God, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to make merry. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, Go, get thee down. For thy people that thou broughtest up out of the land of Egypt have dealt corruptly. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed unto it and said, This is thy God, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. And so it goes when we take religion into our own hands and create rituals or regulations not ordered by God. Of course, the the text I just quoted you from the Jewish Publications Society of the Hebrew Bible 
went on to detail the fiasco of the golden calf. Thousands, literally thousands, were killed at God's command as a result of their sin, which was a failed effort at religion with an incorrect sacrifice. Not all sacrifices are created equal. I like what one modern paraphrase of the Bible describes as God's response that day to religion gone awry. He said as follows, when I settle accounts, their sins will certainly be part of the settlement. God sent a plague on the people because of the calf they and Aaron had made. Not all sins are created equal, but none are ignored. So what do we do with sin? As I go on and describe the contents of this book titled, God, forgive me. The book will answer that thorny question. So it's time I provide an introduction to what you're going to see and hear and what I have written. So this would be my introduction, or as I like to think of it as my moment on the soapbox. Newsflash, God hates religious hypocrisy. It is a particularly distasteful dysfunction for Jews or Christians to exhibit. Therefore, a gut check must be proposed. After all, Jews and Christians share a connection to the God of Israel, to Israel's Bible, and to each other. We're supposed to know better than to wallow in religious hypocrisy. Yet many of us have become experts at sounding righteous, judging others for not being righteous enough, acting self-righteously, or being unwilling to be tolerant of the obviously unrighteous who have rejected the standards by which we have chosen to live. Remember, we, we just can't expect those who reject our standards to adhere to them. And those who are obviously unrighteous immediately recognize when we give ourselves grace to live below our standards while harshly judging them for living below the standards they never volunteered to follow. That hypocrisy should not be tolerated in our ranks. God sets the standards. He doesn't care about our opinions of his decrees. So I have a question. What did God think about his people's lack of care for his laws and the immoral views tolerated and sometimes celebrated by his people? I'll give you God's answer. No matter what I do for them, they still don't care. Oh, what a sinful nation they are. As a modern American man of faith, I have an honest question to consider. Could this same thing be said about our nation? The prophet continued, Born to be bad, they have turned their backs upon the Lord and have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have cut themselves off from His help. We need God, yet we dismiss Him. Have we gone too far? It seems to me we need God's help more than ever, yet as a nation, we have more moral chaos and less respect for God than is wise. The Bible says, Oh, my people, haven't you had enough of punishment? Why will you force me to whip you again and again? Must you forever rebel? The news outlets and nearly every form of social media glaringly prove our spiritual rebellion is in high gear. Will the outcome described by the prophet be our fate. He said, your country lies in ruins. Your cities are burned while you watch. Foreigners are destroying and plundering everything they see. You stand there helpless and abandoned. Is this an apt comparison to how we act in America? And if so, what should we expect if we remain on our current path? If the Lord Almighty had not stepped in to save a few of us, we would have been 
wiped out as Sodom and Gomorrah were, an apt comparison. Do we shudder at the thought of being compared to Sodom and Gomorrah? As I call you now, listen to the Lord. Hear what he is telling you. Will we listen? Since this conversation is about sacrifices and atonement, these texts cause me to remember what God says about our rituals, rites, and empty religious traditions. He said, I am sick of your sacrifices. Don't bring me any more of them. I don't want your fat rams. I don't want to see the blood from your offerings. Who wants your sacrifices when you have no sorrow for your sins? The incense you bring me is a stench in my nostrils. That's the opinion God has. Does God demand our sacrifices to make him happy? Does God watch our religious rituals for entertainment? No. However, as my book in this conversation will show, sacrifices and atonement are relevant in the context of what God wants and what he doesn't want from us. He said, your holy celebrations of the new moon and the Sabbath and your days for fasting, even your most pious meetings, all are frauds. I want nothing more to do with them. I hate them all. I can't stand the sight of them. I guess that sums up his sentiments about some religious stuff. If we understood this, we would quit patting ourselves on the back for learning all the correct moments to shout, Amen, Hallelujah, the appropriate chants, the responsive readings, our holier-than-thou ceremonial dance moves with accompanying bends, bows, eyes opened, eyes closed, hands raised, hands in our pockets, and any hypocritical celebrations of religiosity. God wants our true love and loyal obedience. From now on, when you pray with your hands stretched out to heaven, I won't look or listen, even though you make many prayers. I will not hear, for your hands are those of murderers. They're covered with the blood of your innocent victims. Oh, wash yourselves, be clean. Let me no longer see you doing all these wicked things. Quit your evil ways. Learn to do good, to be fair, and to help the poor, the fatherless, and widows. Blindless, some trudge alone, crushing the weak, oppressing the poor, ignoring the helpless, hating the foreigners among us, mindlessly slaughtering infants, and we wonder why God's blessings seem distant or uncertain. This is not how God wants us to experience life or to express his love to a godless world burdened by rebellion and hopelessness. He declares, come, let's talk this over, says the Lord. No matter how deep the stain of your sins, I can take it out and make you as clean as freshly fallen snow. Even if you're stained as red as crimson, I can make you white as wool if you will only let me help you, if you will only obey. Then I will make you rich. But if you keep on turning your backs and refusing to listen to me, you will be killed by your enemies. I, the Lord, have spoken. Will we cease to spout our arrogant opinions and stop celebrating errant behavior? Will we shed our ungodly attitudes and rediscover the moral compass that honors marriage and respects life? By the way, it is ugly to rail against abortion and refuse to assist those mothers who were convinced to choose life and then abandon them when they need help the most. In other words, we must believe in life after birth and with as much zeal as we believe in life before birth. 
Are we willing to protect the most helpless among us? Will we love the unlovable? Can we cherish the spiritual heritage that has imbued us with the knowledge that these values are truly valuable? Consider a concern about our democratic system. Will we refuse to grant power to the ungodly because of our hopes for personal benefit or the prestige of feeling correct? Be careful about for whom you vote and what you hope to gain by someone's election. You know, there's more to life than benefits from the government or tax breaks because of a government. Politics won't save us. Our leaders don't love us. They simply need our votes to retain power. And some of them love power more than they love serving their nation or the people who elected them. The Bible says your leaders are rebels, companions of thieves. All of them take bribes and won't defend the widows and orphans. Therefore, the Lord, the mighty one of Israel says, I will pour out my anger on you, my enemies. I myself will melt you in a smelting pot and skim off your slag. God hates our violence, our selfish pursuits of self-gratification. He wants more of us and more from us. But the smelting pot seems to be the only solution for removing our dross. If we fail to pay attention, we will pay for much more costly and painful lessons. And afterwards, I will give you good judges and wise counselors like those you used to have. Then your city shall be called the city of justice and the faithful town. Well, we are far from the city of justice. Ask a poor man who was innocently imprisoned or observe the rich who are guilty but free. I'm thinking, O.J., I see a nation with too many politicians who have pandered away their purpose. I see a system with too many lawyers, yet too few who show concern for God's laws. I see too many jurists who have jettisoned their judiciousness. I see dignitaries who have disposed of their dignity. I see judgment on the horizon if we fail to repent and turn to God. Therefore, I hope that we as the people of God will return to him and he will receive us and provide atonement for our sins so that we might enjoy his blessings again as a nation. The promise from God is those who return to the Lord, who are just and good, shall be redeemed. But all sinners shall utterly perish, for they refuse to come to me. Shame will cover you. And therein lies America's greatest problem. We have lost our sense of shame. Few among us know to blush because most among us have lowered the bar so far that we have no reason to hate our sins or find them as despicable as God does. Instead of recognizing our failure as a society to live according to the standards of behavior and morality that God has established, we measure ourselves with a defective yardstick. <laughs> we look pretty good when compared to the run-of-the-mill godless sinners. Some of us even seem saintly compared to haughty, God-fearing sinners who go deeper in filth than others who hide it better. As Paul warned against, they are only comparing themselves with each other, using themselves as the standard of measurement. How ignorant. My prayer is that God has not reached his limit of disappointment and exasperation. May we seek restoration and reconciliation to God, and may he forgive us. I'm stepping off of the soapbox now, trying not to trip. I have an agenda 
alert for us. How many of us have asked the question, God, will you forgive me? Some may assume that the gracious character of God is such that He must forgive us if we ask. Others may think His willingness to forgive is conditioned on our ability to offset our bad actions with a greater weight or quantity of good actions. The essence of such a conclusion might create a desire to lead a moral life to counterbalance wrongdoing with right doing. And that's not a terrible decision, though there may be better ones. Still, some may feel forgiveness is not available to them based on the horrific nature of their specific behavior. In other words, they may feel their actions were unforgivable. Therefore, their destiny is one of bad luck, cursed decisions, and at best, they will end up as the tortured subject of a sad country song. My dog died, my truck won't crank, I'm out of beer and my bass boat sank. <laughs> well, there are at least two other interesting groups of folks who have a more measured view of how to obtain forgiveness from God. And for the purposes of this conversation, I will limit this investigation to sincere followers of Judaism and Christianity observant Jews and faithful Christians base their core beliefs on the Bible. I chose the two adjectives observant and faithful carefully. There are at least a dozen flavors of Judaism and literally tens of thousands of options for selecting a favorite form of Christianity. I am interested in the practices of both ancient Jews and modern Jews were informed about ancient Jews by investigating the Hebrew Bible. We learn about contemporary Judaism from exploring their more modern rabbinic writings and traditions. I'm also focused on modern Christians who still adhere to evangelical biblical orthodoxy as declared in the New Testament and anchored to the Old Testament. Such Jews and most Christians recognize the simple presuppositions that sin is bad, God is good, and the Bible prescribes a spiritual transaction to overcome the guilt and punishment due sinners. One term commonly used by both groups to express this transaction is atonement. Atonement is the theme for one of Judaism's most well-known festivals, Yom Kippur the Day of Atonement. This special day concludes the famous Jewish High Holy Days. Christians pursue atonement differently. Both religions value the concept of sacrifice as part of the atonement process. However, their conclusions are quite different and interesting. The distinctive interpretations of atonement and sacrifice within modern Judaism, ancient Judaism, and Christianity will be probed. Admittedly, I have an agenda, hence the alert in this conversation's uh, section title, an agenda alert. I, I'm Jewish. Judaism is imprinted on every family memory and on every single member of my family. Judaism is what always preserved our family. Judaism is also what drove my father of blessed memory from his native homeland where other Jewish family members suffered and were slaughtered by those who hated Jews. Most tragically, that hatred was often perpetrated by Christians. Perhaps that was why declaring my faith in Jesus as the Messiah cost me the relationships I most cherished. My family and my Jewish friends turned away from me many years ago in early 1973 when I entered Christian ministry. Nevertheless, the fact of my Jewishness is unchanged. My love for my heritage remains precious. I have no reason to hide my beliefs or step back from my Jewish identity. I believe in the grace of God. I rejoice in His love for me and for my people. With the psalmist, I confess, O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord, for He is loving and kind and comes to us with armloads of salvation. 
He himself shall ransom Israel from her slavery to sin. I love that. Armloads of salvation are available. God wants to reach into our lives and break any links that might bind us to bad habits, failures, emotional scars, unintentional and intentional sins. He himself shall ransom Israel. He will pay the full price of the ransom to have us released from captivity. Another modern translation is even more expressive. No doubt about it, he'll redeem Israel. Buy back Israel from captivity to sin. Now, these words may seem extreme. The concepts could feel foreign to folks who see themselves as good people. If people hold themselves to a low enough standard, they may truly believe they're good enough. It's a self-deception. They're only good enough if they compare themselves to very bad people. God requires true righteousness, not self-righteousness or partial purity. Such errant beliefs about being good enough call to mind a sarcastic comment made by the famous concert pianist actor Oscar Levant. He said, I can remember Doris Day before she was a virgin. Obviously, this son of Orthodox Jewish immigrants was being witty when he described the Hollywood icon in that manner. She was praised by reporters in her obituary as Hollywood's favorite girl next door. Her fans saw her as the all-American goody-two-shoes gal portrayed in her later films. However, she had a less pristine image earlier in her career. and She was married four times. Levant's comment humorously elevates a concept I want to explore. Once someone has performed an act that is classified as a sin, having sinned, they are a sinner. Cleaning up one's act doesn't remove their moral deficit. It merely makes them a less repulsive sinner. Atonement is the answer to our problematic question of sin. We are made impure when we commit sin. Purity in God's sight is the goal to which we should strive. And this is not something we can attain without God's help after our lives have been blemished by a sin. Purity in God's sight is not achieved by aspiring to be more virginal than Doris Day or in becoming the nicest person in church or in temple. Unfortunately, we're out of time, so I have to cut this episode off right there. But don't worry, we'll pick up right where we left off in the next episode. If you don't want to wait that long, though, you can order a copy of this book or even get a free, no strings attached PDF copy at our website, crosstalk.org. Until next time, Shalom and God bless.